first things first, I would like to say that I had some trouble in coming up with a catchy title for the video. Why? Because people generally associate taste to be the same thing as flavor, when in fact it is not. Taste is a part of flavor. Flavor is a hedonic sense, which is a collection of different senses that ultimately influence how you perceive your food, the experience of eating your food. Along taste, flavor also includes smell. Smell and taste are the two most important senses that influence the perception of the food that you eat. Alongside of those two, flavor also includes detecting temperature, detecting texture, and detecting strength. So with that said, let's begin with taste. Taste has five different tastes, which include salty, sweet, sour, bitter, and umami. Now that last one, you're probably not familiar with it, and I really don't blame you for that. Umami is associated with glutamate, and glutamate is included in things like meat, eggs, uh, dairy, maybe even some vegetables like tomatoes, and uh, even cucumbers. However, why would we need five different tastes? In fact, why would we need taste at all? Why is it an important biological function? Well, like all other useful biological functions, the reason that it is there is to allow you to keep on living. You see, back when humans were still hunting their own prey and gathering fruits and vegetables to consume, taste was very, very important for their survival. Taste helped them in identifying whether a food is good enough for consumption or not. Is, does this food have enough calories for me to justify me eating it? Or am I going to expend more energy in eating it than actually, well, getting from it? Does it have too many toxins? Is it dangerous for me to eat it? Is there enough, enough nutrients in this thing for my body? Can I, do, should I eat that or should I not? Pretty much. Now, for them, it was very important, but in today's time, you would think that taste is actually not important for your survival because food is available pretty much everywhere. The supermarket is right there, the restaurant is right there. All you have to do, get some money, buy yourself a meal, and well, now you have sustenance to sustain yourself. So for you, taste is not as important as it was for cavemen. However, you would actually be wrong. You live probably in a highly developed country. But there's about one billion people living on the planet right now who use the function of their taste similar to how cavemen used it. They use it to identify food in order to continue to survive. And the reason for that is that they live in an environment where food security is absolutely horrible. You see, evolutionary speaking, the function of taste becomes more important the more diverse a species diet is. For example, pandas. As you know, pandas munch on exclusively on bamboo. It got to the point where they lost the umami taste. They can no longer taste umami because they don't eat meat. Even though, if you check their stomachs, you will find out that they're actually perfectly able to digest meat. Another example is cats. As you know, cats are strictly carnivorous, which means they only eat meat. They can't taste sweet things. They don't have the taste part of taste in them because they don't need it. However, for a species that has a very diverse diet, something like humans, taste is actually a very important function for survival. So with that said, let's find out why do we taste things differently. Why does something taste sweet and why does something else taste, for example, salty? How does this contribute to survival? Now what I am about to mention are what each taste is generally associated with. This is not always the case. Just put that in mind. So that said, let's begin with 
bitterness. Now, the bitter taste is generally associated with how much toxins are in the food that you are about to eat. Okay? In general, the more toxins there are in a food, the more bitter it would taste. But that doesn't mean you would immediately spit it out because it tastes bitter. It depends. It depends. Now, when you find something that you know tastes bitter, you actually ask yourself a question. Your body asks itself a question. Am I really willing to take the risks associated with this bitter food? It has toxins in it. I can process it. It's not really an issue. But if there's too much, I, I might have some problems and that might cause me some damage. But at the end of the day, there's calories in that bitter food and there's nutrients that I also need. So if it is something that's really bitter, then it is not worth it in this case. And you have this reaction that you want to spit out this bitter tasting food. Okay, so if the bitter taste is strong enough, it means in general there's a lot of toxins in it and that means you generally want to reject this food. Okay, cool. Now we move on on to sweet taste, the sweet taste. The sweet taste is associated with calorie rich foods such as simple carbohydrates. Now Sweet tasting foods are actually in a different situation than bitter tasting foods because your body still likes sweet tasting foods even if they, the, the sweetness of them is actually very strong. Your body in this case says this is something that tastes very sweet so this has very low risk in eating it. Please take it. I need the energy please. Okay, And if you find in the future food like that I would like more of it, okay? Cool, you do that. That's what your body is telling you. Anyway, anyway, let's move on, on to the next one. The next one we have is sour. It's the sour taste. The sour taste, in general, is associated with food that has gone bad or has spoiled, okay? So, in general, the more spoiled a food is, the more sour it is. And you will find yourself in a similar situation as the bitter taste. You will start asking, am I really hungry enough to take the risks associated with this sour tasting food? If it is yes, you're going to end up eating it. If it's no, you're going to end up rejecting it. Then you also have the salty taste. And saltiness as you guessed it, is associated with salt, the sodium content of your food. Um, so the more sodium, sodium salt a food has, the more salty it tastes. And again, you will find yourself in a situation, am I really hungry enough to take the risks associated with something that tastes very salty? Too much? Reject it. Yeah, you can take it. Okay, take it in. And then finally, you also have umami. And umami, as I've said before, is associated with meat and dairy. Okay, do you see how each taste actually contribute to survival? Good. Now, before we move on, I would like to show you this. The infamous tongue map. I'm sure you've seen it sometime before, probably in school. The thing is, the tongue map isn't exactly true. Your tongue does not function that way. I'm sure you've tried the experiment as well. You took a piece of chocolate, for example, and you put it in the salty part of your tongue, and you say, well, that doesn't work. And you'd be right, because your tongue doesn't function in that way. The entirety of your tongue can taste the five taste. There are no specific areas dedicated for a specific taste. It is possible, however, it is possible that certain parts of your tongue are more sensitive to certain tastes than other. But it's not going to get to the extreme level that if you were to take something that tastes sweet and you put it on the salty part that you're not going to taste the sweetness. That, that just doesn't. It's not how your tongue works. So I just wanted to point that out. So now, let's move on, on to the second point I wanted to discuss in this video. Smell, which is arguably even more important than taste when it comes to influencing the perception of our food flavor, in this case. Um, so, yeah, in 1988, 
a study was conducted that conducted four different experiments. In the first one, they took a bunch of whipped cream and they added a strawberry smell to it, a strawberry odor to it. Then they also had a bunch of whipped cream, but that didn't have the added strawberry smell to it. They found out that the whipped cream with the strawberry smell had an enhanced sweetness to it. So the whipped cream that had the strawberry smell added to it tasted more sweet than the whipped cream without the smell. Okay. Then in the second experiment what they did is that they added a peanut butter smell instead of this strawberry smell. And what they found out is that this peanut butter smell didn't really enhance the sweetness of this whipped Cream. In the third experiment, they took a salty piece of food and they added strawberry smell to it. They found out that it didn't exactly enhance the saltiness of this, well, uh, salty piece of food. Finally, they pinched some nostrils, like this, and from that they found out that the power of a strawberry smell decreased by about 85% in its ability to enhance the sweetness of the whipped cream. So from that you can see how smell and taste are very important in influencing the experience of eating your food, the flavor of your food. Here is another very interesting thing. Pretty much everyone on the planet can taste the five tastes. However, it turns out that not everyone has the same taste preference. It changes from one person to another. And that could depend on many factors. One factor could be the stage of life that a person is currently going through. For example, it's been shown that pregnant women are much more aversive to bitter tasting foods than your regular adult. They don't like to eat bitter tasting foods. They avoid it like the plague. A possible reason for this um, is the following. I've mentioned before that bitter tasting foods are generally associated with the toxin content of such foods. The thing is, a pregnant woman has something inside of her that's very vulnerable to things. One of them is toxins. So if a pregnant woman eats bitter tasting foods, this means that she could inject toxins that could reach the fetus that is growing inside of her, and that risks damaging the baby and maybe even death. So that is a possible reason for why pregnant women don't really like to get their hands on bitter tasting foods. The thing is, even when the fetus is developed and it is ejected out of the mother as a baby, its strategy of avoiding bitter tasting foods does not change. Now, as you know, children don't really like vegetables and they like things like, you know, uh, sodas, you know, or fried, fried chicken, fried meat, things like that. The, the reason for this is that children and babies, they like umami and sweet tasting foods. A possible reason for this is that they are rich in macronutrients. Macronutrients includes things like proteins, fat, carbohydrates, and those are things that the body needs in order to grow, to develop. And, you know, babies and children, they need to grow and develop. That's why they like foods that taste umami and sweet. However, something that doesn't exactly have that, something bitter, like vegetables, something that is rich in micronutrients like vitamins and minerals, they don't really like it that much. The, th the thing is, micronutrients are still needed by the body, but they are not needed in big quantities like, like macronutrients. They don't really contribute that much to growing and developing. At the same time, there's toxins in those bitter tasting foods, so children are vulnerable to that, and they don't really want to damage themselves. Uh, you know, of course, in today's time, this is not exactly the case because we know what's in those vegetables. So back in the day, there was actually a clear risk in eating bitter tasting foods as a child. You could actually risk damaging yourself. So the next time you try to force 
your children to eat vegetables, just know, just know that you're offering them something that you, you are okay, you're completely okay with, but to them, because of their own taste preference, they view it effectively as, well, poison. Interestingly enough, memory also plays a very important role in food preference. Now, it's not going to be extreme enough. For example, you had a bad experience with a chocolate bar one time in your life, and, you know, the next time you eat the same chocolate bar, it's going to taste like salt. It's, it's not going to be that bad, but you will want to avoid it next time. If an animal, okay, encounters something that tastes new, that will have a new taste, it's actually careful. It doesn't eat it immediately. It hesitates. Is it hungry enough to really eat that new type of food? Does it really want to take the risks associated with it? Or is it better to avoid it and just go for things that it remembers is good for it? It remembers what it tastes like. Is it better to do this or do that? Depending, it depends on how much the animal is willing to risk. Really depends on, well, that. Here is another interesting thing. Research by the Monell Chemical Census Center suggests that food preferences could be determined before somebody is even born. Want your children to like vegetables? Here is the best way to do it. If you have somebody pregnant, have this pregnant woman eat vegetables during her pregnancy herself. And by her eating vegetables, through the amniotic fluid, this gets the baby. So when the baby is born, it becomes more likely to eat vegetables later on. However, if this mother would like to increase the chances of this baby of eating vegetables even further, she should continue eating vegetables while feeding her child through her own breast milk because that itself also transfers on onto the baby and that eventually makes the baby more likely to eat vegetables when it grows up. However, because I've said before that pregnant women naturally are turned off from bitter tastes, this looks like it's possible that it, this is something that doesn't really happen all that much. Now, with that said, here is something. Now, this something contains a few assumptions from my side here. So, take it however you want to take it. Okay? Cool. So, from that, it looks like we are uh, conditioned to like umami and sweet tasting foods as soon as we are born. We're not conditioned to like vegetables and this becomes a problem because as said before memory plays a very important role in your food preference. So if you are a child and you start consuming things like I don't know chocolate or french fries or burgers or any kind of uh, fast food, sweet and umami tasting things, your memory starts to take the things you just ate and implants them into you. So as you grow, your body starts to say to you, hey, that soda that you drank the other day tasted pretty good. There's, there's plenty of energy in that, you know, that burger. There was a lot of, of, of calories and fat that we could store. So your memory is basically telling you, hey, get more of this stuff. And as you continue to grow, you continue to like things like that. So you become more and more conditioned to liking things like fast food and, and sodas and all those things that we consider bad for our health today. Now, those things would have probably been good back when we were still caving, but we live in a developed world now, so things are kind of different. Your body thinks that something might happen someday, and it, can, it continues telling you, hey, consume more of that calorie and fat rich stuff. You never know what happens. You could end up in a desert. Food could become, you know, jeopardized at any point. Winter is coming. You don't know, maybe that could happen. But it doesn't realize that you live in a world where food isn't exactly a problem.
It's not really a problem. You can just show up and buy it. So you continue consuming and consuming and consuming and consuming. And then you become ever more so conditioned to liking these foods even more until you get to the point where you can't give them up anymore. And it becomes very difficult to really give those things up. So that's a very big problem. You, it doesn't help. It doesn't help that your body rewards you for eating things that taste good because, you know, uh, that would feel pleasant. And pleasantness is your brain's way of basically telling you what it needs you to do. And things that are not pleasant is your brain telling you, hey, don't do that stuff. So fast food and sodas and chocolate are things that are pleasant, you are rewarded for it, and you continue consuming it over and over again. So what happens at the end of all of this, where food is abundantly available and our taste function is outdated, it hasn't been updated to the 21st century, and it is still back in the caveman period, what ends up happening is that you end up with the obesity epidemic. So the next time you go up on that scale and you find out that your weight has increased by 5 kilos, don't put all of the blame on yourself. Just know that there are some ancient tendencies at play here that make you consume really, really, really tasty things. A lot. So yeah. With that, that has been my take on why tasty is tasty. Thank you very much.